Lecture 5 is devoted to the analysis of the communicative informational development of the text. The analysis of the communicative development of the text is based on the theory worked out by those linguists who belonged to the Prague Linguistic School. They focused on the functional, that's communicative informational aspect of the language. Czech linguists, Danish, Firbas and others worked out a theory known as functional sentence perspective that formed the cognitive basis for the informational development of the text. It showed how the semantic and syntactic structures of the sentence function in fulfilling the communicative purpose intended for the sentence. They disclosed that the relations of thoughts to each other and mental processes underlie the informational development of the text and affect the arrangement of words in sentences. In other words, they succeeded to uncover the organizing principles in language that account for the ordering of information in this course beyond the level of the sentence. According to this theory, each sentence functionally proceeds from the previous one, pushing the information from the known given information called the theme to the new information called the real. Masesius, the founder of the Prague Linguistic School, defined the term theme under two concepts. One, as the starting point of the utterance, that which is known or at least is obvious in the given situation and from which the speaker proceeds. And the other, as the foundation of the utterance, as something that's being spoken about in the sentence. Accordingly, Remis something what the speaker says about or in regard to the rim, the starting point of the utterance. Massesius focused on the nature of theme as something that can be logically gathered from the previous context, while Rim expresses something unknown, something new that pushes the message forward. Theme rim distribution of information shows clearly that it's impossible to limit linguistic analysis to sentence structure, that functional analysis of language units require a textual level. Scholars focus on the importance of themes and topics in text building, claiming that the information that is contained within the themes of various sentences of a passage correlates with the method of development of the message. passage. A concentration on the theme has frequently tended to involve a relative neglect of the rim, except in its static conception as the newsworthy element of the message. Another Czech linguist, Firbas, considers that themes will be the main constructing elements of the text, while rims will push the message forward. Most linguistic studies illustrate how the functions of themes and rims have tended to be treated separately. A more dynamic view is that of Danish's concept of Semantic progression. He claims that the organization of information in text is determined by the arrangement of utterance themes and their rims. His concentration on the relationship between successive themes and their rims would appear to provide a more satisfactory account of the method of development of texts. Similarly, Firbas points out that it is typically the rim 
that represents the core of utterance, the message proper, pushing the communication forward. From the viewpoint of text organization, it is the theme that plays an important constructing role. The semantic organization of the text is closely connected with its coherence or connectivity. A text is defined as text largely in terms of its semantic coherence. However, it is useful to remember, as Danish points out, that texts are not always perfect. They not only display coherence to an uneven degree, but same, some may be characterized as discontinuous. The reason for less than optimal coherence may be that the speaker or the writer is simply not controlling the mass of new information that is successively accumulated as the text unfolds. This mass of information is mostly so intensive that the speaker or the writer necessarily makes a choice, and this choice, as Danish claims, is predetermined directly or indirectly by the selection of utterance themes. Danish's important contribution lies in the fact that he expanded the concept of theme as point of departure of a single utterance sentence to that of explaining the inner connectivity of texts. His basic assumption is that text connexity is represented, among other things, by semantic progression. By this, he means the choice and ordering of utterance themes, their mutual contamination and hierarchy, as well as their relation to the hyperthemes of the superior text units, such as paragraph, chapter, etc., to the whole text and to the situation. As Danish indicates, Semantic progression might be viewed as the skeleton of the plot. Danish postulates three main types of semantic progression. The first type is simple linear progression of information during which each rim becomes the theme of the next utterance. This type of communicative development of the text can be represented schematically, where the vertical arrows indicate the process of the semantization of rhymes in each following sentence. You see this scheme on your monitors. We can apply this model of semantic progression of information, for example, to a textual segment borrowed from All the King's Men by Warren. The symbols T and R in the brackets are designating themes and rhymes correspondingly, while the numbers in them indicate the number of sentences. Let's read the text. Then Lucy Stark got up from her chair, walked to the boss, and laid her hand on his writer. He drew away without looking at her. After a momentary resistance, he followed her, and she led him back to the chintz-covered big chair. The second type of communicative development of text is Semantic progression of information with a constant continuous theme. The essence of this model lies in the fact that the theme preserves its stable position, remaining unchanged throughout the whole microtext. While the text unfolds with the help of rhymes, each of them introducing into a sentence a new piece of information concerning the theme. Graphically, it looks like this. You see that the theme 
which is designated here by the letter T, remains unchanged throughout the whole microtext, while in each sentence it takes a new rim which brings a new piece of information concerning the theme. This type of semantic progression of information is common in monosemantic descriptive microtexts. For instance, this model can be applied to the microtext borrowed from Huxley's Chrome Yellow. The author depicts an impressive verbal portrait of Ivor Lombard, the main hero of the passage. Let's read the text. Nature and fortune had vied with one another in heaping on Ivor Lombard all their choicest gifts. He had wealth, and he was perfectly independent. He was good-looking, possessed an irresistible charm of manner, and he was the hero of more amorous successes than he could remember. He had a beautiful, untrained tenor voice. He could improvise with a startling brilliance rapidly and loudly on the piano. He was a good amateur medium and telepathist, and had a considerable first-hand knowledge of the next world. He could write rhymes with an exceptional rapidity. For painting symbolical pictures, he had a dashing style. He excelled in amateur theatricals, and when occasion offered, he could cook with genius. He resembled Shakespeare in knowing little Latin and less Greek. For a mind like his, education seemed unnecessary, since his natural aptitude would only have been destroyed by training. The third type of communicative development of the text is semantic progression of information with derived themes from the hypertheme. Danish's own illustration of type 3 is a short description of New Jersey. Intuitively, we would feel that texts about places tend to occur in various written genres, discounting for the moment spoken genres such as casual conversation. We can find this model of semantic progression of text in encyclopedia entries, tourist guidebooks, travel brochures, and as settings to narratives. On the basis of linguistic evidence regarding the realizations of themes and dreams, we might be able to hypothesize which type of semantic progression might be prevalent in this particular genre. Descriptions of places, as of persons and things, abound in everyday printed matter. Here is a short description of a quiet resort spot, St. Vincent, from the holiday section of a Sunday supplement to the observer. Let's read the text. St. Vincent is small, 18 miles long and 11 wide, mountainous and lush. Banana plantations clang to steep volcanic hills and coconut palms sway and the brisk trade winds which lash the Atlantic coast. The people are warm, friendly, and poor. Unemployment is between 30 and 40 percent, but few go hungry in such lush surroundings. The semantic progression type adopted in the St. Vincent text consists entirely of derived themes from the hypertheme, which is represented by the toponym St. Vincent. The only exception is that of clauses 24, which is simple linear, since trade winds belonging to the rheumatic complex in clause 3 converts into the theme of clause 4 which is represented lexically by which. Semantically, there is a great variety of derived themes that are not restricted to geographical features. In the text, 
They are represented by the italicized words banana plantations, coconut palms, trade winds, the people, unemployment, and the few, which inform not only about the landscape and plants, but also about the people with their unemployment. The communicative intention of the writer of this text seems to be aimed at an educated, though conservative English-speaking tourist reader with conventional ideas about tropical countries. Banana plantations are considered to be exciting for such readers as are coconut palms with appropriately descriptive accompanying circumstances. Therefore, the pragmatic purpose of such texts is that of persuading the potential holidaymaker in contrast with the purely informative purpose of the encyclopedia entry. Graphically, this model can be represented by this scheme. The capital letter T at the top indicates the hypersim, which in the text is represented by the toponym St. Vincent, whereas the arrows point to the constituent microsemes, each having its own rim or rheumatic complex. Danish remarks on possible complicated utterances built up by coordination, nominalizations, apposition, relative clauses, etc. He indicates that certain combinations may constitute semantic progression types of a higher rank, representing a formal frame for the employment of the basic types. The most important of such frames is a semantic progression of type 2, that's semantic progression of information with a constant continuous theme with complicated split frames, often quoted as type 4. The peculiarity of this model lies in the fact that split frames here have their own steam rim structure as they are always represented by propositional constructions in which subject predicate semantic relationship is realized. For instance, let's read the text. I saw the people walking in the plaza of little town in the desert. I saw the waitress in the restaurant wave in feeble protest at the fly. I saw the traveling salesman standing at the hotel desk just ahead of me. I saw the sheep herder standing alone on an enormous mesa. I saw the Indian woman with eyes the color of blackstrap molasses looking at me over a pile of pottery. As I looked at all these people, I felt great strength in my secret knowledge. In this example, semantic progression of the text is carried out with complicated split rims represented by propositional nominalized constructions as complex objects which create syntactical parallelism, thus making the narration more expressive and emotional. It should be noted that such complicated models of semantic progression of information is found only in fiction texts. The analysis of the empirical material shows that in English literary texts, semantic progression of type 2 can be complicated with a parallel theme rim development of the micro themes constituting the theme as a whole. We have this type of thematic progression of the information and the text given below. They stood before each other now. Lester pale and rather flaccid, Robert clear, wax like, well neat and shrewd. Robert was the clean, decisive man, Lester the man of doubts. 
Robert was the spirit of business energy and the integrity embodied Lester, the spirit of commercial self-sufficiency, looking at life with an uncertain eyes. Together, they made a striking picture. This textual segment represents a microtext in which semantic progression of the information is realized according to type 2, which is modified in a peculiar way. The same of the message is represented by the Kane brothers Lester and Robert, whereas the rims contain their contrastive characterizations, pushing the message forward to the final phrase in which the brothers are again jointly represented as one whole making a striking picture. Danish claims that the main types of semantic progression are to be considered as abstract principles, as models or constructs constituting a functional explanation of the ordering of information in microtext. On a macrostructural level, they may be employed in various combinations as we rarely meet text with only one type of semantic progression. The implementation or manifestation of these models in particular languages depends on the peculiarities of the given language, especially on the means which are available for expressing functional sentence perspective. However, these models of semantic progression of the information appear to be universal for many languages and fully applicable to any kind of text. Therefore, an awareness of them will be helpful in revealing the internal organization of the communicative development of the text. That's all for this lecture. Thank you for attention.